that we can call you friend. We thank you that you have been so good to us. That you are consistently kind. You are always faithful. God, right now in this moment, we remember your goodness. And we worship you in this place. Church, would you just sing this out to God this morning? are good. We thank you for your goodness. Your goodness that gives us a fresh start. Your goodness that has done so much for us. Your goodness that sent Jesus when we were far from you to bring us back. Your goodness, Lord. We believe that you are and you are good. We believe that you are and you are good. And we thank you for your goodness in our lives. We thank you for showing us your goodness in every area of life. And in the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, my name is Jason. I am uh, the executive pastor here, and we want to welcome you if you're a guest with us. One of the things that we say is to try us out three times. Everybody say three times. Come on, say it again, three times, because we want you to get the full experience of who we are as a church. Try us out three times. Uh, you can check out our notes on the Uversion app there if you're going to follow along with us today. If you're watching online, uh, maybe in the church online, uh, YouTube, Facebook, wherever you're at, take time, like comment, uh, review our page, and that helps us to get the word out there and to let more people know about Rise Church and to share with us here. So a little bit of a unique week that you are here because I am introing a series that we're about to go in called Unshakable, Unshakable. And so I'm going to help set uh, the tone and uh, bring some definition to what we're talking about. And so here's a few things that you need to do when it comes to this series is number one, go out and buy the Unshakable book. Everybody say $10. It's a $10 guide that you can follow along with what we're talking about each week, including this week, the intro week. Uh, and uh, we also uh, have those out there. If you can't afford the $10, just let us know. We'll make sure that you get one. Uh, the, the next thing you need to do is come every week and hear Pastor Aaron preach. Everybody say, Pastor Aaron. So you're going to get the $10 guide. You're going to come back and hear him preach this uh, great series. And then the third thing I want you to do is get in a group. Everybody say, group. So you can go out there, check out our groups booth, or go to our website and uh, see what groups are open. Get in a group today. We have men's groups, women's groups, open to all groups, young people groups, uh, not so young people groups. And uh, you can get in a group today. And even if you're not in a group, we want you to get this guide. Follow along. Follow along with your family. Uh, I'm going to uh, reference this again a little bit later in my message, uh, but we're going to jump in. So. The series is called Unshakable, 
And what it's about is the unshakable kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is one of the top themes in Scripture. In fact, it's throughout the New Testament. It's throughout the Old Testament. Jesus talked about it a lot. So in order to understand what Jesus means, we've got to know what he means by kingdom. And I think that most times, people in the world, people in the church, don't understand what he means by kingdom. And if we want to understand what Jesus meant, we need to know what do we hold on to when everything is shaking. So if you turn in your Bibles to Hebrews uh, 12, that's where we're going to be today. Or you can follow along, get the Version app follow along or uh, your Bible there. You have a Bible app of, of, of some sort. Go to Hebrews 12. Now, a little bit of a backstory on the book of Hebrews. Uh, one, we don't exactly know who wrote it. Some people, a lot of people will say it was Paul. He never references himself. He never says, hey, this is Paul writing it. So we don't exactly know it's possible that he did write it. We know that he's writing to Jewish believers in Jesus. And let me set the context of what's happening in that day. That people in the church are being mistreated, treated improperly. They're they're, they're having their property stolen. They're, They're often brought into the public square and beaten, some to death. They're ostracized. They're 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 not the in crowd. And so the book of Hebrews is just masterfully written because what's happening at the day is they're trying to figure out like what's going wrong why is everything around us shaking what why is this hey and so people had different theories in the church world at that time there were some that were like you know what we need to do is get back to the customs of early, early Judaism like I know we couldn't follow the law but let's try to law harder I know we could, like the priesthood was flawed, but let's try harder. I know that we couldn't keep the commandments, but let's try harder. Which is literally the opposite of what Jesus came to do. And what the writer of Hebrews does is he just masterfully says, here's Jesus compared to Moses, superior. Here's Jesus compared to the law, superior. Here's Jesus compared to the commandments, superior. Here's Jesus compared to the sacrifices, superior. Here's Jesus compared to the priesthood, superior. It's masterfully written. And so when we come down to chapter 12, it's really wrapping all that up and say, let's get back to Jesus. We don't need to get back to the law. We don't need to get back to the rituals. We don't need to get back to all that. What we really need to do Let's get back to Jesus. Let's look at Jesus when everything around us is shaking, when, 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 when we feel weary, when we feel like, ah, it's too much. And I think that's the world we live in. I saw a comparison uh, video yesterday, and it had the celebration of the new year in 2020, uh, 2004 versus 2024. Like in in 04, I mean, everybody was like, whoa, there was an energy. Same place, Times Square. And then 24 was like, here we go again. Like a big difference, and everybody's on their phones, and that probably has something to do with it, but with uh, this. uh, Hebrews 12, 28, this is going to be our series theme verse. So mark it in your Bible. Come back, you're coming back to it. You're going to hear it again. Hebrews 12, 28, reading in the New International Version. He says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Everybody say unshakable. Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your word, alive and true. What you spoke to the first century church is applicable to us today. We hear your word. We respond. We are thankful and worship you with reverence and awe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. When I say the word kingdom, what comes to your mind? You might think of like, do we have some kingdoms in the world? Okay, we got the United Kingdom, 
right? When you think of the kingdom, you might think of like, you know, some sports fans call themselves such and such kingdom, you know, chief's kingdom, the kingdom of Wakanda. Like, you might think of knights, you think of like a royalty, you might think of chivalry, you might think of something that's like archaic and pass by. Sometimes we'll use the word kingdom as like an insult. Like when someone has a lot of power and they're trying to like build their own thing, we say, oh, you're just building your own kingdom. The kingdoms of this world, they come and they go. But I want to give you a little bit of the kingdom context in Scripture, as that's what we're doing today. We want to make sure that when Jesus is talking about this, like, what is he talking about? Because if we misunderstand what Jesus is talking about, if we have a picture of what he's talking about, and that's not what he's talking about, we'll misunderstand everything he said. So we go back to the beginning. Let's rewind all the way back to the beginning. God creates Adam, he creates Eve, really with this intent, it's not specifically spoken, but like, he's like, I am the king of all. I am the king of creation. God the Father is like, he's there, and he is king over all creation, and he welcomes Adam and Eve into his kingdom, into the garden, to rule and reign with him. But you know, what happens is they decide to break God's one rule, which was do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God is setting himself up as king, original thought, and their response is, nah, we're good. Which we can look at that and be like, oh, they ruined it for us. How could they ever do that? Like, that's, what we, that's our response every day. And so God in his goodness, he doesn't leave them in just this thought of them rejecting him as king. He's, he forms a family called Israel, and it's, his, it's where he's setting up his kingdom. It's his family, it's ruling, and he sets himself up to be the king. And then all around the world, there's other kingdoms trying to compete with that. But as he grows this family... Eventually, they come to him and they say, hey, you know, all the other nations around us, all the other kingdoms, they have a king that they can see. We don't like having a king that we can't see. Can we have a king? And he's like, well, I'm warning you, if you get a king, he's going to take your stuff and he's going to go to war and he's going to build walls and he's going to build, it's, it's, it, there, there's taxes. And they're like, we still want a king. And in fact, the prophet Samuel, like, he's like, oh, man, I failed the people. They want a king. And, and God says to him, this is a great, 1 Samuel 8, 7. Look, look at this, this concept. He says, listen to all the people are saying to you. It's not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. A kingdom has a king. And so then Saul becomes the king, starts off good. He's prophesying, Woo. and he's like, you know, I'm the king. I can do whatever I want, and he disobeys God. God takes the kingdom from him and gives it to this other guy named David, and we like David because it says he's a king after God. He's a man after God's own heart, but even he doesn't do it all right. He still messes up. He's not quite the king that represents the king. And then his son comes, and his name is Solomon. And you know, he's wise, but just as wise as he is, he's unwise. Just as much as he wrote wisdom, he did a lot of unwise things. And, and from him, this kingdom that God formed called Israel, his people, then breaks in two. One part becomes the kingdom of Judah. One part becomes the kingdom, kingdom of Israel. And that's the beginning of the end for God's people. Because you fast forward, and both of those kingdoms wind up falling to other kingdoms around the world, because that's what happens. Kingdoms come, kingdoms go. They go both into exile. You got Egypt attacking. You got Assyria attacking. Then you get Babylon coming. 
then the, the Medes and the Persians, and then the Greeks, and that, all these things happen. The Greeks take over the world. These kingdoms are fighting. And then the Old Testament prophets, they're like, hey, y'all, hope, here's some hope. I know everything around you is shaking, but here's some hope. There's a king coming, and he's after the line of David. And he's going to have an unshakable kingdom. Let me point, and prophet after prophet, they all point towards this king, this coming king. And so they hear that in that context, and they're like, they're looking at the stuff that they're in that's shaking around them. They're like, it's just one kingdom after another taking us over. First it was the Assyrians, then it's the Babylonians, then it's the Medes, then it's the Persians, then it's the Greeks, then it's the Romans. And they're like the best at this thing. They're taking over the whole world. And we get that context as we come into the New Testament that God's people Israel are under the occupation of the Romans. The Romans actually rule. There is no more Jewish king. There is no more king, Israelite king. There is no more. And they sort of have got back together, but the people have been all scattered and wiped out. And, 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 and it's never back to how it was. And they're like, they're waiting for this prophecy to come true. Like, how is it all going to go back? How are we going to be the number one kingdom in the world again? We want to be number one again. And that's the backdrop on which Jesus shows up on the scene. And as we turn to Mark 1, our key passage for today is one of the Gospels. And the Gospels, what they do is they tell a perspective about Jesus' birth and upbringing. In fact, Matthew and Luke, they do that very well. They like get all into the birth of Jesus and how he came. And Matthew gets into, they get into the lineage and all these different things happen. And we read those at Christmas on Christmas Eve. And we read that story. But like Mark, he skips all that. If Mark were alive today, I believe he would be a comic book writer. Or he'd be an action movie writer. Because like his is the shortest book. And it's always like, if you read it, you like think it'll all happen in like a week. He like makes three years of stuff happen in like a week. And you're like, whoa, whoa. But he, who is he writing to? He was writing to the Romans of his day who were like action-packed Ameri I mean, uh, Romans. So here's this. He just gets right into it. Mark 1, 14. Second part of 14 through 15, he says, now Jesus went into Galilee. Proclaiming the good news. Everybody say good news. The time has come. <gasps> They're like, whoo. Remember all the context. He's like, the time has come. Because people are like looking at this guy and he's different. And he, he's, uh, he says, the kingdom of God has come near. <gasps> Everybody say kingdom of God. They're like, yeah. Now, their context was as they've been under occupation, under occupation, under occupation, under occupation, under occupation, under occupation. So he's like, the kingdom has come. And they're like, oh, the king is here. So they would expect him to say, like, get your swords, get your bows and arrows, get your shields, and we're fixing to take down the Romans with some kind of miracle. But that's not what he says. He says, repent and believe the good news. There's that word again, good news. So the kingdom, which he is talking about, is not what they were looking for. People, someone asked me that this week. It's like, why did the first century Jewish people not accept Jesus? It's because they did not understand what he meant by kingdom. And today... If you're here and you're rejecting Jesus, it's probably because you don't understand what he means by kingdom. If you're not living for Jesus, I believe it's because you don't understand the kingdom, the concept of kingdom, which is the rule and reign of God. It is a way of thinking and living. It's the rule and reign of God. It's saying, I believe and I am under his rule. I am under his reign. If there is a kingdom, there has to be a king. And he's the king. The reason they rejected Jesus as king is because they thought it was going to be something different. It's not. They misunderstood and they missed the whole thing. Yeah. 
So what did he say we had to do to respond? Number one, he said, repent. How do we respond to the kingdom? We repent. What? Now, again, when I say repent, there's a whole bunch of like loaded imagery there. Like in the church I grew up at, that meant you come down here and we had like another step down there and you got down there and you, boy, you better cry. I see some of you, you're like, yeah, and you better be sad. You worthless piece of humanity. Cry! Be sad! You're terrible. And we're like, oh, when Jesus says that word, we're like, ooh, gross. But literally it means this, to change direction. It, the, the literal translation is to have a new mind, to change your mind. Not change your mind is like, oh, I changed my mind. It's like, no, 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 I used to think this way about the kingdom. Now I think this way. I used to have a different perspective. Now I have a new perspective. I used, my life was going in this direction. Now it's going in this other direction. It's changing from where you were going and putting it to a new direction. Now, lived in Texas about five and a half years, and one of the things I I I've come to love about Texas, I didn't like it when I first got here, is like when you're like driving on a service road off of a highway. In some states, like there's like a two-lane service road. I know some of y'all who only been in Texas, you're like, what? But in Texas, it's like whatever side of the road you're on, that's the direction that the service road goes. And you got to do that whole U-turn thing. And you got to, so for me, since I got used to driving in Texas, what I do is I don't go to a gas station on the other side. Sorry, if you're on the other side, you don't. And that's why you see like gas stations like right across from each other. And you're like, how could they do? Well, it's because they're like people like me that I'm, I'm not getting into u turning, And then I got to go back and U-turn again. And, and, like, and I'm like, well, I, I was on a trip for, for, for my kids. It was during spring break. One, like the second year I was here and I went to Florida. And we're, you know, we're doing like a quick trip. Like we like literally left Sunday after church, drove all the way through 20 hours, drove back 20 hours, all the way one shot. And I'm driving back and I, and, and, and like the only place to get gas and I'm like at the top of Florida, I'm about to get out of Florida. As the only place to get gas was on the, uh-oh, left-hand side. So I get over there, I get the gas but, like, I'm in the, the Texas mentality, and I got places to go. I got to get home. I'm going to set the land speed record. So I start driving. And, you know, and usually, like, I punch in my, like, Waze or Google Maps or whatever, but I'm like, I got this. And I'm driving along after this bathroom break, and I, you know, hurry everybody in the car, and we get in there. And it's like a pit stop at NASCAR. It's like, oh, we're in and we're out. And I'm like driving, and I'm like, something doesn't seem right. You know, like everybody's in their world in the car. They're all on their, you know, devices or reading or whatever. And I'm like looking at the little thing up there that says what direction. I'm like, why does it say S? That should say N. That something's not right with this thing. I'm driving north, not south. This is wrong. So we're like another 10 minutes. I'm like, come on, this thing's got a secret. Maybe it's like one of the, how the road turns or something. I'm like, oh, now it says E. No, 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 that's not right. It's supposed to say W or N or NW or WN. It is not supposed to say SE. And then I just pull up ways and I'm like, home. They're like, at the exit in five miles, please make a U-turn. <sighs> I figured it out. But well, once I figured it out, I didn't keep driving in the wrong direction any longer than I had to. That's what repenting is. 
It's you realize I'm headed in the wrong direction. I've got to find the next exit and turn around. So in this series, what's going to happen is that the word is going to challenge your thinking in some areas. So what you have to be ready for is realize your compass is off. You think you're headed in the right direction, but you need to recalibrate it to the word and be headed in the right. You've got to be willing to change direction. Be willing to repent when it comes to the kingdom. The second thing he says is believe. What are we believing? He said the gospel. The Greek word is evangelion. It's like the, the good news, the gospel. And every time Jesus shares the, the, the gospel, he connects it with the kingdom. The kingdom is good news. The arrival of the kingdom is good news. It's the rule and reign of God. So it means that God has shown up to set things right, to redeem us, to restore us in this broken world. And our good news isn't going to come from around the world. It's going to come from God's word. It's going to come from his word. That being said, as we're setting the series, and I don't want to get too much into it because I don't want to rob all Pastor Aaron's points, and he's like, hey, you took all my stuff. <laughs> What's the two views we can have on life? What are the two directions that we can be headed in? One is the natural view, the world view. And it starts this way. It starts with this belief, I am the king. And when you are the king of your own life, you've got to do everything you can do to live your truth, to do you, to try to be happy, to try to make it happen. And because of the fact that you are the king, then the next thing that happens is because you're kind of a crummy king, you don't feel safe. You're unable to protect yourself. You're a king in a dangerous world, unable to protect your kingdom. And because then you don't feel safe, you need to protect yourself. So you just try harder to protect, to protect your kingdom, to defend it at all costs. And because then you're trying to protect yourself, you then become worried about your future or the future of your children. You know, anxiety is at an all-time high. I don't need to tell anybody. If you don't know that, I don't know where you live or if you have a cell phone or a TV. Like, anxiety is at an all-time high. This is the first time in history that young people, I see you young people here, they are more likely, they are safer than they've ever, do you know that kids are actually safer than they've ever been? From, like, external things harming them. This is the first time that internal things have become more dangerous than external things. And again, I could get up here and preach again. I could tell you when that happened in 2008, when the, the readily availability of smartphones opened up. Like, and, 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 and the thing is, is like, we like think, like, here's how like old timers, I'm, I'm going to get on y'all for a second. We're like, we are so much tougher than these little wimpy kids today. Yeah, because you didn't know anything. <laughs> now we like know everything, things we ain't even supposed to be knowing. We're worried about everything. Just watch the news, man. Just like, and measure the anxiety on the inside of you, like when you watch things. Because they're like, they're just like, they're just inventing stuff to be scared of. And, and just feed ourselves on that. And, and anxiety, like, we become worried. Then we're like, I'm the only one who can make this happen. I'm in charge of me. So when Jesus came, he did not come as a religious teacher offering some more information. He came as a king with the kingdom. He isn't just the, hey, I'm Jesus. I'm founding a new religion. It's called Christianity. You want to join? Convert. He wasn't just a prophet. He wasn't just a good man. Jesus is not a religious teacher offering information. He's a king with the kingdom. He set himself up as a king. And if he is king, we have to be careful of how we live our lives. I like to uh, 
be a blessing to my family sometimes. And uh, I love my, my wife, and like she loves to bake and make cakes, and she decorates, and it's all delicious. And, but, but the thing is, is like she'll spend so much time on our kids' cakes. It's like a whole week process, and then she'll make me. It's just, it's, she pours a lot of love into that. So it's like every time it comes around her birthday or something special, I like to try to return the favor, but like I can't decorate anything. Don't, don't, you know, it's like you know, I'm not that kind of artistic uh, so I'll, 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 I'll make her something. And because she has a gluten intolerance, is, is it's a little harder, right? And I make every year for her birthday a uh, flourless lava cake. And what I love about it is it's so simple. It is so simple. It has, like, simple ingredients. It's like, you need an egg. I'm like, I can do that. Start with an A. Then it's like, add some butter. Butter. I can do that. Right? It's like, add some sugar, which I don't see. I don't have any sugar. Uh, <laughs> it's simple. It's four ingredients. It's unsweetened chocolate, sugar, butter, egg. Melt the butter and chocolate. Add in sugar an egg while you're, you're beating that, and then put the melted, and then put it in the oven and bake it, and it's simple. But she's always like, oh, this is so good. You know, you just bake it just right, the right temperature, the right time. You put the little toothpick in there, it comes out clean, it's all bouncy. You put a little scoop of ice cream on there, like, it's really making me hungry right now because I'm doing no sugar this year. Uh, and I'm thinking about that. But imagine, if you will, that I look at this recipe and I'm like, mm, you know, that's too simplistic for me. I don't want to follow a recipe. Who are you to tell me what I should do? I'm going to make my own recipe. And so I get in there and I'm like, you know, okay, well, I like butter, but I'm going to add the I can't believe it's not butter. And I take my, my, instead of chopping up chocolate, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to put the cocoa powder in there. And, this, and I know some of y'all might do it that way. That's the wrong way, by the way. <laughs> you want like, and, 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 and instead of, of, of measuring it out, I just put it in there. Well, I forgot to take the eggs out first. <laughs> and I just, you know... I just decide to do this in whatever order I want. And I decide to add some other stuff in here. Because I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. It's the bar We eat more barbecue sauce per capita. Uh, the Texans will say, that's because your barbecue stinks. Uh, <laughs> wrong, wrong. And I love me some barbecue sauce, so I put it in there. And because my kids, they like ranch dressing... I'm just going to, my daughter, she loves some ranch dressing. I just decide I'm going to put that in there. And, 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 and I decide, like, I like some Reese's pieces. And I decide I'm going to put those in there. And I'm like, well, what about some pudding? And, you know, I kind of like ketchup. But I like it when it's not in the refrigerator. Looky there. And I say, you know what? I'm going to get me some Doritos, but I'm going to crush them up and put them in there because I like Doritos. Put some little crunch in there. And then I mix this bad boy up. Mmm. I know y'all want some of this. I know there's some boy here who's like, I'll taste it. It's not a girl usually. It's always a boy. They're like, I'm fixing to taste this thing up right here. This is, mm. <sighs> Whew, I, it's a good thing because of that mountain cedar I can't smell right now. <laughs> That's a mess. If I put that in the oven and bake it, guess what's going to come out? A mess. Guess what's going to happen? A mess. It's going to burn. I don't, even, I don't know what it's, it, it, it's probably going to catch on fire. 
And, it's, and, and if it doesn't, it's still not going to taste good. And that's the problem with our world today. Is we don't want to follow the recipe of egg, sugar, chocolate, butter, Jesus. We're like, you know, I'm just going to build my own religion. I'm going to put a little Buddhism in there. Oh, yeah, I'm going to put some Buddha in there. I'm going to put a little manifesting in there. I'm going to put a little politics in there. I'm going to put a little, oh, my gosh, I can't smell it. <laughs> I'm going to put, oh, man. <laughs> The ranch plus the Doritos plus the chocolate, that's not a good smell. And that egg, no, 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 no. Oh, 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 that's disgusting. <laughs> I would taste it in front of y'all, but y'all don't want to see that. Oh, that's gross. We put a little crystals in there. We put a little new age in there. We put a little... Be good enough in there. Follow the command. Uh, follow, uh, hey, I'm going to try harder. Little live your truth in there. Little you do you. And at the end, we've just got a disgusting mess. Because then we add Jesus to it and we're like, well, that should fix it, right? Like, I'm just going to add Jesus to the mixture of the mess of my life. No, 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 we got to throw all this away and get back to the simplicity of his kingdom. Get back to his kingdom. Who is Jesus to you? Jesus is not a way. He's the way. Jesus is not a truth. He's the truth. Jesus is not a life. He's the life. Jesus is the only way to move from our natural view to the kingdom view. So if the natural view says, I am the king, when I start to look at it through Jesus, I come to, I serve the king. I was the king, now I'm serving the king. If, if, if it was, I don't feel safe, I now say, oh, God's watching over me. Now I feel safe. If it was, I need to protect myself, I remember and I look at it through Jesus and I say, God has prepared my future. He's protecting me. I, I, I move from being worried about my future to realize this God is guiding me. And when I understand that God is guiding me, it defeats anxiety in my life. And lastly, when I realize, like, I'm not, I'm not the one who can make this happen. God is in control. I'm on his course. Not mine. Our hope is, after this series, you move from a natural view to a kingdom view in every area of your life. I'm just going to get a couple, couple areas. A couple areas. We're going to touch on these throughout this series. What does this look like practically? I'm going to end this with a practical. In the economy, the natural view says this. Man, there's job uncertainty. Uh, you know, like the market is up and down. There's inflation. I feel helpless. I need to act. I need to do something. The kingdom view says God is my source. He's a, he's, he's a good shepherd, so I'm a good steward. He's generous. He meets all my needs. I believe that. As parents, our natural view can look at this and say the culture is dark today. It's more challenging than ever. That's like what we say. That's what we look, if, 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 and that's laughable, by the way. To the New Testament church, they'd be like, are they killing those kids? Is there temples where children are being mistreated and uh, unspeakable things are happening? No. They have Facebook. So I get it stark. But the kingdom view says this, God's word is true. He is active in moving in the lives of young people. This is why we're doing this series in kids and youth too, by the way. We're doing unshakable kids and we're doing unshakable teenagers. 
because we know that God's working in them. Next thing, worry, anxiety. Our view is, well, if I can control it, I'll be safe, which is an illusion. Control is an illusion. The king of you says this, God loves me. He's still on the throne. He's still reigning. He's still ruling today. That's the view that we have. During this series, the challenge that I want to give you is make sure you get the unshakable guide. We're, not, we're actually not making money on these, by the way. They're, it's a very good guide. But what I love about it is every week it has a verse to memorize. And, and, and if you don't know my background, I got my start in ministry. The only place they would let me minister was to the kids. Like when I felt like I was supposed to be a pastor, I went to my pastor and I'm like, you know, I know you're going to resign uh, because I'm going to be the pastor of this church. And they're like, no, get out, go to the kids, which is kind of weird if I like, hey, go to the most vulnerable, uh, <laughs> most impressionable. And what I loved about kids' churches, we used to do this thing, and like, we would do stuff like this all the time. This is why, and when you see me do this, I light up, because it's like this, and like, there's always a boy who's willing to eat that. And what I used to do when I first, I'd be like, okay, we're going to let you eat it. And then, you know, after cleaning up a few times, <laughs> won't go further into that. But we used to play games. Because, you know, like, our pastor preached so long, that doesn't happen here, uh, We would come up with games that we would play, and we did something called the memory verse game. We still do some of, somewhat of this, but like, we were real big into, we would create these elaborate games where you would take a verse from the Bible, and you'd like put it on t-shirts, put like a word on the t-shirt, and you have a pile of the t-shirts, and you get a bunch of kids, and you're just like, how fast can you get in the right order of the, of the verse? Or we would like, you got to throw this ball through that hoop back there, say the verse, go catch, you know, someone's got to catch it and throw it back, and they got to say the verse too. You do something like that, it was basically just get them to repeat the verse over and over and over again. And we'd be like, hula hoop while saying the verse. Pop these balloons while saying, I mean, like, it was, it was, you know, we just came up with something different to do each day. And it was always a game where we would repeat, and then, hey, if you come back next week, and know the verse. We're going to give you a full-size candy bar. And like two kids would do it, two homeschoolers. Uh, <laughs> but we still did it. And, and, and we did it. And we did it. And we did it. And, and what I noticed is over the years is like the curriculums that you would buy would have a memory verse in them. But like the, the further along we went, like they eliminated the memory verse. Because they're like, only the two homeschoolers are getting a candy. And the older we get, we stop memorizing things. I just want to challenge you during this, this. I know you're doing your Bible in a year plan or your verse of the day plan. Could, could I just challenge you? Is to take these verses each week. You can get them right in here. They have little cards. I already pulled mine out of here. Let me see where I got mine at. It's in my Bible here. Here's the, the, they're just little cards. Write it out. Say it out. We're going to put it up on the screen and we're going to practice this. Take the word and put it in here. Take this word and put it in here. Your view is not going to change without this. So we're going to do that right now. Everybody say Psalm 62. 1 through 2. Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from Him. Truly He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Psalm 62, 1 through 2. My encouragement for you is to take the Word, read it, pray it, say it, Repeat it, write it, repeat it, say it, meditate on it, write it, highlight it, underline it, circle, 
highlight it again, write it again, highlight it, underline, say it, do it again, repeat, 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 repeat. Because what you don't even realize is your anxiety has been on repeat. The thing that's causing you to worry and feel like you're the king of your life has been on repeat. And so the only way to replace it is to replace it with something better. Every head bowed and every eye closed. My question for you as we end this first message of the year, this intro message to this unshakable series, is have you received the kingdom? By that, I mean, have you dethroned whatever it is that is king in your life, whether it's you or something else or a relative or someone else? Have you dethroned whatever is taking Jesus' place on the throne of your life, on the throne of your heart, on the throne of your spirit? Have you made him king? Have you surrendered kingship to him? If you have not and you want to do that today, every head bowed, every eye closed, would you just raise your hand? And say, today, I want to make him king. Today, I want to dethrone whatever it is. I see that on the on, hand on the left. I, I, just raise your hand and say, I, I see the hand over here on the right in the front, in the back. I want to make him king of all in my life. Would Church, would you re- join in with these as we repeat this? Say, Jesus, you are king. You are Lord. I follow you. I surrender to you. I live under your rule and reign. I change direction from my own direction to your direction. From my kingdom to your kingdom. I follow you all the days of my life.